Okay, I'll let some participants roll in. Yeah, it looks like here they come. Welcome, yeah. everybody. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you for coming to our panel, Clean Energy, There is No Nuclear Option. My name is Jillian Thayer. I am a 1L Pilk representative, and I will be moderating this panel. I just have a few announcements, and then we'll get started with the panel. Don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar, so all the attendees are automatically muted with videos off, so we will only be able to see the panelists. Throughout the panel, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. All our panelists will be giving their presentations, and then there will be a 15-minute Q&A session at the end where the panelists will answer your questions. Please remember to be courteous of all viewpoints throughout the presentation and Q&A session. Additionally, if there are any legal professionals in the audience wanting to earn CLE credit for this panel, we will be dropping the link in the Q&A. Also, our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, helps to provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. If you are interested in making a donation to help provide students with those stipends, information to do so will be on a Google document in the same link provided for the CLE credit. Lastly, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Elihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya peoples in the Wilmette Valley and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. I'll now introduce our panelists. So starting off, we have Damon Mott's story. He lives in Portland, Oregon and serves on the advisory board of Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, where they also work for several years as Healthy Climate Pro Program Director. Damon has over five years of experience working in effective coalitions for climate and environmental justice and is frequently invited to speak on the economic, environmental, and health impacts of nuclear power and radioactive waste. Our next panelist is Anna Molina. She is the field manager with Columbia Riverkeeper, whose mission is to protect and restore the water quality of the Columbia River and all life connected to it from the headwaters to the Pacific Ocean. As the field manager, Anna crafts and implements strategic community organizing campaigns for the Columbia Riverkeeper. Anna previously was statewide environmental justice projects manager for Beyond Toxics. We will also hear from Kathy Sampson Cruz of the Walu Walulapan Band, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. She is an elder champion of the Thin Green Line movement opposing fossil fuels export along the Columbia River and from other Pacific Northwest ports. Kathy frequently testifies at public events opposing the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure in the Columbia Basin and the installation of small modular nuclear reactors at the Hanford Reservation. Last but not least, we will hear from Catherine Chetty, who is a retired therapist with a master's degree in interpersonal communication. She volunteers full-time with local and regional groups engaged in active climate resistance in the Pacific Northwest. Catherine is on the board of Oregon Cons Conservancy Foundation, working to protect the environment from further harm caused by nuclear power and fossil fuel exploitation. Thank you all so much for coming. I'll now hand it off to the panelists. Thank you so much, Jillian. Uh, my name is Damon Montstory, and I'll actually be going at the end of the presentation. We swapped our order around a little bit. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Catherine who can get us started. Good afternoon. We appreciate the Law Conference for hosting us and all of you for joining us. First slide. So, um, I'll start it by saying that nuclear power is unaffordable at any size. And unaffordable means not only dollars and cents, but also time and unacceptable risks and harms. Next slide. At four in the morning on March 28th, 1979, a partial meltdown began unfolding at Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Although there had been other close calls before, this was the first major commercial nuclear power plant accident in the United States. 
A Newsweek article a few weeks later noted that a large segment of the American public has never been convinced that atomic energy is safe, and even proponents admit some stubborn safety problems, for instance, how to dispose of radioactive wastes, remain to be solved. Meanwhile, across the country, out here in Oregon, the Three Mile Island accident added to concerns already raised in years of public education by anti-nuclear activists, along with persistent efforts to shut down the Trojan nuclear power plant located on the west bank of the Columbia River. The plant began operating in 1976, and after 16 years was finally closed permanently in 1992 by its operator, Portland General Electric, after cracks leaking radiation were discovered in Trojan steam generator tubes. Next slide, please. In 1980, Ballot Measure 7, sponsored by Peter Bergell and Chuck Johnson, was approved by Oregon voters, in spite of the campaign being massively outspent by opponents 20 to 1. I was living in Salem at the time and worked on the campaign to get Measure 7 passed. The new statutory ballot measure law in Oregon regulating nuclear power has protected Oregon for more than four decades. The law specifically requires a federally licensed repository for disposing of high-level radioactive waste and a statewide vote of the people before a nuclear plant can be cited. It is now 42 years later and still no such federal repository exists. Trojan was built before this law was passed, so all of the high-level radioactive waste from the Trojan plant still sits in dry casks on a concrete pad at the site in Rainier, Oregon. Next slide, please. In 2007, New Scale, an Oregon company, was founded based on research funded by taxpayers through the, Department, the United States Department of Energy. This research was conducted by Oregon State University, the Idaho National Laboratory, and other colleges. New Scale was granted exclusive rights to the patented small modular nuclear reactor technology. 15 years later, New Scale's design and costs remain untested and unproven. In spite of proposals in a number of worldwide locations, no New Scale nuclear power plants have been licensed or constructed. Next slide, please. Financial troubles have plagued New Scale and have been well documented. The latest report just released by the Institute for Energy, Economics, and Financial Analysis concludes that the project poses major financial risks and little upside for utilities that choose to in invest. The authors used the company's public statements, reports, presentations, disclosures, and correspondence with regulators to draw their conclusions. Although the report focuses on the small modular nuclear reactor project to be built in Idaho, the Institute outlines cost risks, construction timelines, and competitive alternatives for all buyers in the market for small modular nuclear reactors. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, in Oregon's legislature, New Scale has tried repeatedly since 2015 in all four full legislative sessions to either exempt themselves from Oregon's 1980 ballot measure law or to overturn it. In 1921, there were actually three bills sponsored to do this. Those of us who worked so hard to pass the Measure 7 ballot measure into law way back in 1980, continue to show up and testify against New Scale's persistent efforts in order to keep the law from being amended or appealed. As Measure 7 sponsor Peter Bergell testified in March of last year during a hearing on proposed Senate Bill 360, the industry has always claimed that this problem is either solved or will be solved soon or can be gotten around somehow. For 70 years, we've not seen this to be true. The concern about nuclear waste that voters expressed by passing Ballot Measure 7 in 1980 remains just as valid today. And as long and as longtime anti-nuclear activist Lloyd Marbet testified at the same legislative hearing, now we are told that nuclear scale reactor design bells and whistles are going to function without failure or error, even in the midst of a climate crisis with its crescendoing catastrophic events, similar to the siren song sold to us long ago for reactor designs that have historically failed and for which no electricity 
electricity produced was too cheap to meter. Next slide, please. Oregon now has new legislation passed in 2021 promoting non-emitting electricity, which opens the door for new scale to make a stronger case for repealing the 1980 ballot measure law. By setting clean energy targets for Oregon, centered on using non-emitting electricity for compliance with the 100% clean energy for all bill, nuclear energy magically becomes clean energy. Next slide, please. The nuclear fuel cycle clearly contradicts the deceptive assertion made by nuclear power advocates and those interests and those insisting on an all of the above menu of solutions for solving the climate crisis, that nuclear energy is clean simply because no carbon is emitted at the generating site. Regardless of size, reactors are carbon intensive to build and the nuclear fuel chain that supports reactor operations, which involves uranium mining, milling, processing, enrichment, and fuel fabrication, then shipment of fuel to reactors, then reactor operation, and finally millennia of radioactive waste storage results in substantial and unavoidable carbon emissions. It defies reason to consider that a cycle so beset by human and environment harming emissions, including radiation as well as carbon, can ever be considered clean energy. Next slide, please. So we can certainly expect to see new scale back in Oregon's next full legislative session in 2023, using the House Bill 2021 law to make their case, equating non-emitting as clean and drawing support from anyone who is somehow taken in by the deception that nuclear energy should be a climate solution because it has been greenwashed with the word clean. We know that new scale will keep on coming until they can either exempt themselves or repeal the 1980 ballot measure law. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, in, in Washington state uh, in 2019, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, otherwise known as CETA, commits Washington state to an electricity supply free of greenhouse gas emissions at the generating source by 2045. Like Oregon, legislators chose two years earlier in Washington to include non-emitting sources along with renewables in the Washington policy for transitioning to a clean energy economy. And they refused to explicitly exclude nuclear power for compliance with the law. Those of us who made the journey up to Olympia to testify with our concern and register our objections about this were falsely assured that nuclear power would not get traction in Washington. Next slide, please. On April 1st, 2021, the Tri-City Herald in Kennewick, Washington announces a tri-party agreement signed between X Energy, a nuclear reactor and fuel design engineering company, Energy Northwest, formerly the Washington Public Power Supply System, and Grant Public Utility District for construction of a 320 megawatt helium gas cooled pebble bed advanced nuclear reactor on property leased by Energy Northwest at Hanford. Next slide, please. The public relations that accompanied the announcement of the partnership for X Energy at Hanford is highlighted by Clay Sell, the CEO of X Energy, explaining that his Maryland company chose Hanford in Washington state to operate the nation's first advanced nuclear reactor because CETA, quote, created the commercial framework for nuclear power to succeed and to succeed wildly which Mr. Sell describes enthusiastically as transformative for the nuclear industry. Next slide, please. This informative report shows that for the nuclear industry, there's nothing like succeeding at taxpayer expense. The executive summary states, after 60 years, the nuclear power industry remains heavily dependent on subsidies, faces costly and unresolved waste disposal challenges, and leaves a long trail of ongoing environmental liabilities from uranium mining contaminants to water pollution. The true reality is that we, the taxpayers, are funding nuclear power in spite of the fact that it can't come online in time to address the climate crisis, while it irreversibly uses financial resources that could be invested in conservation and renewable energy, which are readily available and can come online in time. 
Next slide, please. So this cartoon kind of says it all. There's nothing like corporate socialism when you're addicted to constantly feeding at the government trough. Next slide, please. So back in 2014, Michael Mariotti at the Nuclear Information Resource Service pointed to three of what he termed fundamental misperceptions. Number one, the carbon dioxide is the only pollutant that matters when defining clean energy. Number two, that because radiation is invisible and odorless, it is not a toxic pollutant. And three, that nuclear power is carbon free. Michael noted that none of these are true and offered his prophetic conclusion regarding nuclear power that, in spite of the greenwashing promotion of the industry that has since been embraced by some in the pursuit of finding solutions for the climate crisis, nuclear power is dirty energy and does not belong in a clean energy standard. Next slide, please. So um, the Oregon Conservancy Foundation offers a resource guide with live links to all source material contained in this presentation, plus additional information. And I wanna suggest that if there's gonna be something that you would choose to start with, given what's going on in the world right now, there's, um, I think it's this under the number one, the Manual for Survival, a Chernobyl Guide to the Future by Kate Brown. It's compelling, it's um, devastating, and it's definitely worth reading given what's unfolding in the world right now and particularly in Ukraine. Um, and this resource guide is also available. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna finish with uh, the Henry David Thoreau quote. And the cost of a thing is what I will call the amount of life which is required to be exchanged for it immediately or in the long run. Thank you for listening. And I'll put, I, I was gonna put in the chat, but I'm not sure I see a chat, the information at the bottom, which is the Oregon Conservancy Foundation um, phone number and emails. So thank you for your time and attention. Great, that, thank you, Catherine. And we're gonna run right into Kathy's part of the presentation. So Kathy, go ahead. Good day. My native name is Weyausuks. I'm from the Wolulapum Band of the Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Our homelands are in the Blue Mountains, up through the Walla Walla Valleys, down the Columbia River, and they do encompass parts of the Hanford Reserve. Ironically, in our Treaty of 1855, Chief Pio Pio Mox Mox was to have his home at Columbia Point near Richland. In the age of the global pandemic, climate change, which has been catastrophic, severe food and water shortages, and now Putin's war on the Ukrainian people, I think it's only right of us to just take a moment of silence. Thank you. So we acknowledge that in these sacred places, there has been many challenges. I have to first say strongly to Oregon State University, President Ray, who accepted a new scale award with their parent company floor. Are you listening on this website? Or are we talking to all our allies and our friends? Are you listening to the people in the state of Oregon who say no, that you should have been stopped 22 years ago from developing on the campuses of a land Grant University. We used to say Three Mile Island. We used to say Fukushima and Chernobyl to sum up our arguments against nuclear power. Now we continue to say gravely, seriously, 
the Columbia Generating Station in Hanford. Most recently, Putin's Russian invasion of the Ukrainian homeland and the war crimes against Ukrainian people. Only Friday, he shelled the nuclear plants. There are 15 within their homelands of Ukraine. We're all on alert because Europe could be contaminated. I think back to 1945. Yeah, it's nine years before I was born, but my grandparents live near Echo, Oregon, where the mines were, the mustard mines, where there were secret operations and atomic weapons were being made. 77 years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago. And here we are, 2022. My colleagues and friends on this panel are well-versed and I appreciate all the study and the research they've done to make this as educational as possible. I'd like to take it another way. And that's to look at uranium and uranium mining. Because of the 574 federally recognized tribes, it is so disheartening to know the tragic numbers since that atomic weapon was developed in 1945, that there are 4,000 uranium mines ac across the Western United States. Not only our tribe and the Yakima Nation, the Nez Perce and the Warm Springs along the great Nichiwana, the Columbia River are effect, affected, but our sister tribes, the Hopi, the Arapaho, the Southern Cheyenne, the Spokane, the Laguna Pueblo, and the largest of them, the Navajo Nation. Can you imagine? In the Navajo Nation alone, their lands were blasted 30 million tons of ore. Their cancer rates skyrocketed. Their people, of course, recruited to work, women, men, and children. It, it just continues to be so disturbing. Those 520 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation was still gamma radiation levels more than 10 times the background level. Can you imagine? their water and their food source, their air continually contaminated to this day. Yet we're supposed to believe that SMNRs will provide a safe future energy independence. Well, I tell you, President Biden, and your billionaire friends, the Bezos and the Gates of the world. This is insanity. The DOE is gonna funnel billions of dollars into this wasted sense when we could have a true green energy sector. So when it reared its ugly head in Oregon again, My colleagues and I got together and said, ATNI, the Affiliate Tribes of Northwest Indians, is going to be meeting in Portland. And we need to get a resolution together as fast as possible so that our tribes can understand the devastating effect historically and currently and future of this false solution. I'm really thankful to my panelists 
that helped make this happen and to my younger brother, Don Sampson, who presented it with our team to the 2019 Winter Convention, Resolution-1910. And I ask you all to keep, keep this close to you. Use it when you can to say, we are with you. We want this stopped. We do not believe in these false energy solutions and we say no to war. My friend Chuck Lloyd, we were sending some emails a while back about some of this. And one of the things Chuck said, Chuck Johnson, who used to be with OPSR, I'm gonna quote him. The bottom line for this is what it has always been. There is no working model of a small modular reactor. So this legislation is very premature. The waste from small modular reactors, particularly the new scale version is the same as that, the concern to Oregon's when they passed measure seven in 1980. The alternative fossil fuels that don't have problems associated with nuclear power are available now and becoming exponentially more efficient and inexpensive. The storage methods for intermittent power sources like solar and wind are also becoming more efficient and inexpensive. I read this to my grandson who's a sophomore in high school at Nihawi Community School. And the answer is very clear to him. I would never vote for nuclear power, Kafla, which means grandmother. So in closing, we in the great Pacific Northwest have a groundswell, a groundswell of people who have strengthened the thin green line of resistance against those who wish to plunder the land, air, and water that all creatures who depend on it to live. And we must remain united and vigilant against any greenwashing of nuclear energy. So join us, Kuali Sam Chana. We are all treaty people. We are still here. I Katsiaya, thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Very appreciate. Thank you so much for being a part of the panel with us and for sharing what you just shared. Um, and I have the, the full text of that resolution up on the screen right now, but I'm gonna move it forward and introduce Anna Molina with Columbia Riverkeeper. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Kathy, again, for being with us here and grounding us in that context of, of nuclear energy and what it means. And so uh, I'm with Columbia Riverkeeper. I have offices in Hood River and in Portland, or on the traditional ceded territories. Uh, uh, the con excuse me. Okay. The Confederate Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, uh, the Confederate Tribes of the Warren Springs Reservation of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakama Nation, who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. Uh, last year, Columbia Riverkeeper launched our small modular nuclear reactor campaign to protect the Columbia um, and its people. Uh, from nuclear reactors and waste. And today I'm gonna to discuss a little bit about that report that we released, some of the risk, why nuclear power is a false solution to the climate crisis and how you can spring into action as well. Next slide. And I wanna, uh, Kathy talked a little bit about Hanford and the significance there. And so just to provide a little bit more context and Hanford because Hanford is the most contaminated place in the Western addressing climate change instead of building more nuclear. The U.S. government produced plutonium for atomic weapons during World War II and throughout the Cold War. And for decades, the federal government stored highly radioactive and toxic waste in 177 underground tanks and or dumped the pollution directly onto the ground. And again, this site has great traditional and religious significance to Columbia Plateau tribes 
and is home to the traditional cultural properties, traditional use areas, and as well as significant ceremonial sites. Uh, next slide. So I shared that background is because Hanford, um, it, info on Hanford is because the federal government leased an area of Hanford for private development known as the Energy Northwest Campus. And this area is currently home to Washington State's only commercial nuclear power plant, the Columbia Generating Station, and is prime real estate for nuclear developers. The Energy Northwest, formerly known as the Washington Public Power Supply System, or WHOOPS, once intended to build a fleet of nuclear plants at the site, and it built just one and famously defaulted on 2.25 billion in bonds, which was the largest municipal bond default in the US history at the time. Next slide. And so what's currently uh, proposed here is the X Energy wants to site four small modular nuclear reactors on the Energy Northwest corporate campus, north of Richland, Washington. And small modular nuclear reactors, also known as SMRs or SMNRs, produce up to 300 megawatts of power. And the reactors are assembled in factories and transported for on-site installation. The proposed small modular nuclear reactor is X Energy's high temperature gas cooled XE100 reactor. And each reactor is stocked with billiard, billiard ball sized pebbles packed full of uranium fuel. Next slide. And is this uh, financially viable? And what about any of the permits for this uh, siting? So in 2020, the US Department of Energy awarded X Energy 80 million in initial funding to build the XC100 reactor through the Advanced Reactor Administration Program. X Energy's CEO, Clay Sell, served as Deputy Secretary of Energy for the US Department of Energy from 2005 to 2008. And on April 1st, 2021, X Energy, Energy Northwest, and the Grant County Public Utility District signed a memorandum of understanding to partner and support the development of the X1, XE100 reactor to receive funding from the federal government. X Energy had to show that they could meet a seven year time frame from testing to building the reactor. And the company claims the XE100 reactor will be fully operational by 2028. And nuclear power is extremely expensive. SMR construction costs may be lower than larger nuclear reactors, but they fail to yield competitive electricity costs due to their smaller size and lower generating capacity. Costs increase if these reactors attempt to vary their output, output to complete renewable sources, to, com to complement renewable sources of energy that have variable outputs. The stories of nuclear power projects, like my colleagues have shared before, um, it shows that over the decades, they carry recurring themes such as cost overruns, delays, setbacks, and abandonment. A global study found that 97% of nuclear projects have ended with final cost exceeding initial budgets with an average overrun of 1.3 billion. So lastly, if a company wants to site their nuclear reactor in Washington, they must, fo they must follow the federal regulatory process administered by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission which is the NRC and the state regulatory process administered by Washington State's Energy Facility Site Evaluation Council, which is EFSEC. X Energy has a few options for attaining federal licenses. They can pursue the two-step licensing process in which the NRC reviews the safety to the preliminary plant design and the proposed site and then issues a construction permit. And X Energy or X Energy must also begin a certification process with EFSEC to fulfill the state regulatory process. Through this process, an environmental impact statement and air and water discharge, discharge permits are also developed. Uh, to site, uh, to date, uh, X Energy has only engaged in pre-application interactions with the NRC, and these interactions began between them, between X Energy and the NRC in September 2018. So my organization at Columbia Riverkeeper, we are keeping an eye on all of this and ringing the alarm. Um, next slide. And then going back to small modular nuclear reactors, they're not a new idea, even though they're being touted as both safer and most cost-effective. Small uh, reactors date back to the first flush of nuclear reactor design and construction. In the 1950s, the US Atomic Energy Commis Commission funded the construction of several small power reactors that were declared to be suitable both for use in rural areas and for foreign export. But all these reactors ended up shutting down early because they were not economically competitive. 
And small modular nuclear reactors, just like nuclear reactors currently in, oper in operation, produce nuclear waste with no additional geologic repository. The toxic and radioactive waste is stored on site in dry casks licensed by the NRC. And the waste stays radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. The XE100 reactor in particular produces large volumes of spent fuel and more than 10 times that of a light water reactors per unit of electricity generated due to its unique fuel technology and the XE100 and its unavoidable nuclear waste would increase the radioactive burden to the land and surrounding communities for generations. Hanford, home to the first plutonium production facility in the world, now contains over 500 contaminated facilities and structures and the legacy of Hanford's radioactive waste caused extensive pollution and impacted the health of workers at Hanford and surrounding communities. Next slide. So is this small modular nuclear reactor competitive uh, with renewable sources? Like Kathy mentioned earlier, uh, renewable energy sources are compromising, are, prom are promising competitors to nuclear energy. The cost of solar and wind energy has decreased, making the technologies more accessible. And between 2009 and 2019, the US utility scale solar energy cost saw an 89% reduction and wind energy saw a 70% reduction, while in contrast, nuclear energy costs increased by 26%. Electricity generation from wind and solar has quadrupled over uh, uh, the past decade, while nuclear energy production has not changed. Next slide, Damon. Thank you. And then this is all, again, we've been saying a false solution to the climate crisis. Uh, we have some uh, nuclear regulatory commission members who've come out in the past year or so uh, rejecting nuclear energy. Uh, in, 20, in July 2021, we saw Alison McFarland's, uh, who was a former chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, write an article titled, Nuclear Energy Will Not Be the Solution for Climate Change. There's not enough time for nuclear innovation to save the planet. I think the title speaks for itself, and McFarland's argument supports the idea that renewable energy Resources, resources such as wind and solar will outstrip nuclear energy in their ability to rapidly decarbonize the economy. And McFarland identifies SMRs as a false climate solution. And then we saw earlier this year, former heads of nuclear regulatory agencies in the US and in Europe sent shockwaves throughout the nuclear industry, putting out a statement opposing nuclear energy as a climate solution. And nuclear backers, Backers claim that a new generation of nuclear, including small modular nuclear reactors, will be clean, safe, smart, and cheap. The nuclear regulators assessment said that this is fiction. Uh, they explained that the reality is nuclear is neither clean, safe, or smart, but a very complex technology with the potential to cause significant harm. Um, so as we see, nuclear energy will not deliver necessary greenhouse gas cuts by the 2030s. Uh, nuclear energy's lengthy development and construction timelines coupled with the overwhelming construction cost of, of the number reactors required to make a dent in the climate crisis. So in short, nuclear energy creates a new crisis, long-lived radioactive waste without solving the climate crisis. Next slide. And then lastly, I want to conclude uh, with what's at stake if um, the small modular nuclear reactor proposal goes through here at the Hanford site. At Hanford and the surrounding, the surrounding Hanford Reach National Mon Monument holds immeasurable, immeasurable significance to Columbia Plateau drive, tribes. Hanford encompasses a large area within culturally significant lands of the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Nez Perce Tribe, and the Wanapum people. Native people have used the Hanford area since time immemorial to hunt, fish, gather food, trade, and live. And this area has incalculable traditional and religious significance to, to their tribes and is home to multiple traditional cultural properties, traditional use areas, and as well significant ceremonial sites. Hanford is also a hotspot of biodiversity. The Columbia River's Hanford Reach is particularly significant. Uh, the reach boasts 50 miles of free-flowing river and the largest remaining spawning grounds for fall Chinook salmon on the main stem of the Columbia. And there's more that 
Hanford area contains the largest remaining intact shrub steep ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest, providing habitat for a diverse range of native plants and animals. And I do just want to mention um, this last quote from uh, the Confederate tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. So on August 6, 2020, they wrote a letter to the US Department of Energy opposing X Energy's proposal. And the letter states that CTUIR, CTUIR does not support the deployment of small modular reactors or any new additive nuclear mission at the Hanford site. The letter details CTUIR's Hanford policy, which notes Hanford and Hanford affected lands and resources should not be further developed and no new nuclear fuel storage undertaken unless explicitly permitted by the CTUIR Board of Trustees through government to government consultation. CTUIR does, concludes that new nuclear reactors and their toxic long-lived waste are an affront to CTUIR's treaty honored rights. And so how can we take action and uh, why, like, why should we take action? Next slide. Um, in conclusion, uh, reasons to take action um, are to stand in solidarity. So uh, like I mentioned, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation oppose small modular reactor development at Hanford. Uh, there's the dangers from nuclear reactor operations, like the high temperature gas reactors, such as the XC100 design, are susceptible to minor failures that may trigger an accident. These failures coupled with human error can lead to large scale disasters. In addition to technology specific accidents, the site itself is vulnerable to earthquakes and flooding that are capable of triggering a reactor incident. And then lastly, just the threats from nuclear waste. SMRs, just like nuclear reactors currently in operation, produce nuclear waste and the waste stays radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, which creates a substantial burden on those future generations. With no, ge with no national geologic repository, this toxic and radioactive waste is stored on site. So, um, you can sign our petition on columbiariverkeeper.org and our present our report on what I just talked about is also on our site as well. So again, new, new nuclear reactors have no place in hand for survivor future. Thank you. Hand it off to Damon. Thank you so much, Anna. And I know that we're running up against that 15 minutes we had wanted for questions. So I'll try to do a very condensed version of my presentation. But thank you, Anna, for all details around Hanford, Columbia River, and the X Energy Project. Um, this is a little bit about me. Again, my name is Damon Montessori. I'm on the Advisory Board of Oregon Physicians for Safety Responsibility. Um, and during my five years on staff there, I did quite a lot for uh, various national, local, and state level uh, advocacy for a nuclear-free uh, power future. Um, I had put a moment to pause in here to recognize um, the situation in Ukraine. But um, I think Kathy did a really nice job of that. And again, we're crunched for time, so I'm just gonna keep moving right on. Um, so this is a still frame from a movie that came out on Netflix uh, over the holidays, Don't Look Up. Um, it's an allegory for climate change. It's quite clear in that. Um, but I wanted to bring it up and sorry to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but um, as a comet is uh, hurtling towards earth uh, about to wipe out humanity, a tech billionaire, uh, stops and, and halts the, uh, the proven solution to uh, uh, divert the comet off course and instead puts a tech uh, savvy, a new, a new untested technological solution out there uh, to break apart the comet uh, before it hits the earth so that he can uh, harvest the rare and precious earth metals. And I think this is one of my favorite parts of this particular story, this particular movie, because it helps to illustrate uh, that there are many unproven, untested, and driven by profit solutions to the climate crisis, um, uh, such as carbon capture and storage, which may have been the writer's intended illusion here. Uh, but the metaphor works very well for a range of issues, including nuclear power, and I think the brilliance of this metaphor really shows that it touches upon a deeply human desire to find a quick fix to an enormous and complicated problem. Um, but uh, in reality, that's going to be our undoing if we uh, double down on these untested, uh, uh, un unproven solutions that serve to uh, make capitalism uh, function well, but uh, not actually address the ecological crisis and that our root causes. Just a few numbers on nuclear power. In the past 25 years, only one new plant has come online. 
about a fifth of our nation's electricity for the past three decades has come from nuclear. Uh, our reactors are aging. The oldest one is 53 years old in New York. Um, and the Energy Information Administration at the United States government projects that even if new generation were to come online, there will be less nuclear generated electricity 30 years from now than there is now. Um, and as we've heard already, the cost for nuclear has been getting more expensive as wind and solar have gotten less expensive. This is a map of where the different nuclear power plants are. The Columbia Generating Station, which Kathy and uh, Anna both mentioned, is there in uh, eastern Washington. And you can see that most of the reactors are actually east of the Mississippi River. I want to also highlight that we heard about Three Mile Island, but actually just four months after that was the, uh, the nuclear accident in the United States that what released the largest amount of radioactivity. And this was the Church Rock uranium mill spill on the Navajo Nation. It contaminated groundwater and rendered the Puerco River unusable to local residents, mostly Navajo peoples who used the water for drinking, irrigation, and livestock. They were not warned for days of the toxic dangers of the spill, and the governor of New Mexico refused their request that the site be declared a federal disaster area. In total, a thousand tons of solid radioactive waste and 94 million gallons of liquid radioactive waste from uranium mining for nuclear weapons and energy uh, was spilled into Navajo land and water. And you can see here this sign in English, Spanish, and Navajo uh, that is keeping people away from the water after contamination. Um, we heard from about new scale from Catherine's presentation at the beginning. I want to highlight some of the numbers behind that. First, we've heard small reactor designs promoted since the 1950s, and they've all failed due to being uneconomical. In 2018, the total cost estimate of New Scale's proposal in Idaho to Utah customers uh, was going to cost $4.2 billion. And less than 18 months later, that cost swelled to $6.1 billion. This is a pattern that happens a lot with new nuclear build promises. Additionally, the project proponents wanted it to come online by 2015, but the delay has been so long that it's now been 15 years behind, and they're saying it will no, long, no sooner than 2029, 2030 be in operation under their current projections. Um, and uh, the total in federal grants received by New Scale from the U.S. government across 30 different grant awards is $1.1 billion, but they haven't actually generated any, any clean so-called clean electricity for our grid. 720 megawatts is the size of the reactor that they want to, um, or the, the total size of the fleet of a bunch of small modular nuclear reactors all in a big stack. Uh, that's how they're proposing it. Uh, and already eight cities within the Utah uh, municipal utility systems uh, have dropped out of investing in this project after learning uh, about opposition from the Utah Taxpayers Association, a very right-wing group. Um, and we are actually seeing this pattern play out across a lot of different so, you know, so-called red states. Um, also in Wyoming, uh, we have seen uh, some, uh, a Republican women's group and, uh, and children coming and testifying about how they don't want to see Kenimer, Kenimer, Wyoming become the site of Bill Gates' new natrium nuclear reactor design that he's uh, trying to build there. Um, so we're seeing actually quite a lot of opposition from across the polit political spectrum that is um, bringing these projects uh, to a screeching halt in a lot of locations. We're seeing that also in Pueblo County in Colorado where New Scale came to give a presentation and provoked widespread public outcry uh, when they were proposing the idea of switching a coal power plant over to a small modular nuclear reactor fleet. Um, and uh, as we've seen in multiple parts of this presentation already, part of the reason why this is not gonna work very well uh, is because nuclear is so expensive and these small modular nuclear reactors do not take advantage of the economies of scale that come from larger conventional reactors. And all of those reactor proposals are facing uh, enorm enormous delays and cost overruns and not getting off the ground. But then again, the bottom line is we just don't need the nuclear power. This is a, um, a fall 2021 journal entry in uh, renewable energy from a, a crew of uh, folks in the Department of Civil and Engineering, Environmental Engineering at, the, uh, at Stanford University. Um, and their analysis shows that uh, we can make the transition off of fossil fuel electricity uh, with just wind, solar, water, and battery storage. Um, and that uh, using grid modernization and stability uh, as well as decentralized renewables on your roof and uh, on, on your homes, 
uh, it, this is this is a way that we can get there without having to uh, tap into nuclear power. And so, especially as we uh, pass more clean electricity standards and make it uh, impossible for the fossil fuel industry to continue, we have to also think about scaling up to replace the aging nuclear fleet. Uh, we've heard a little bit from Gregory Yaksko, uh, uh, former Nuclear Regulatory Commission chairman, um, was also there during the Fukushima disaster. Um, and he, along with Allison McFarlane, agree that uh, it's just not possible for nuclear power to uh, scale up uh, fast enough to be an effective part of the climate solution, even if it didn't have all of the contamination and injustice issues that we've discussed today. Um, is Again, the new scale proposal is the furthest along of all of the advanced nuclear reactor uh, proposals with the regulatory and licensing process uh, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and their soonest date for operating is 2029 or 2030, which is uh, far too late uh, for addressing the largest emission reductions that need to happen in this decade, according to the IPCC. So uh, again, sorry for going into the question and answer time, but I did want to just uh, you know recap that we've heard a couple of ways to get involved. Go to Columbia Riverkeepers website, uh, read more about the Umatilla Tribes uh, letter against the X Energy site in Eastern Washington, and read the Affiliated Tribes of the Northwest Indians resolution on this issue. Uh, get involved with the Oregon Conservancy Foundation. I will also add, please, if you could go to OregonPSR.org. That's OregonPSR.org and sign up for that email list there. There's a lot of great actions that you can get involved with. And on the screen here are just a couple of recommendations for how you can get involved uh, if a reactor gets proposed in your community um, and uh, what we can do to also use those same advocacy tools to support cleanup of places that have been contaminated by the nuclear industry already. Um, so I'll pause there and whatever time we have left, we can, we can take some questions. Um, Jillian, are you going to run that for us or? Yes. So Great. thank you all so much for these presentations. We will now start the Q&A portion of the panel. So please drop any questions for the panelists into the Q&A function. It's going to be right down by the leave button at the bottom. I do want to give a forewarning though, that if we go up until exactly two, we will get booted from the Zoom because there's a panel that's going to be coming after. Just, you know, I don't want anyone getting cut off. Jillian, would it be helpful if I maybe typed some written answers into the, the questions as well? Yeah, yeah, you could do that as well. I'll read some of these out just okay. to, for everyone to see. So I know that someone was asking if we could clarify what percentage of Oregon's electricity comes from nuclear power? Yeah, so it depends on where you are in the service territory. If it's Pacific Power or Portland General Electric, those are private utilities that um, I think PGE has like a limited purchase contract with the Bonneville Power Administration, which markets um, Columbia generating stations electricity. And Bonneville Power Administration's portfolio is almost all Columbia River hydroelectric uh, energy, but about eight to 10% of it is the nuclear plant in Eastern Washington. So if you're, for example, a Eugene Water and Electric Board customer, uh, you'd probably be getting about eight to 10% of your electricity from nuclear. Let's see. Any thoughts on nuclear as a source of power outside the U.S.? For example, I know France relies on a significantly a significant um, reuse policy that cuts waste, and they have also recently announced that they are looking to invest to increase their output, fix issues with old plants. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know a lot about the exact percentages and numbers off the top of my head, but I do know that Germany is an example of a European country that has decided to really divest. Uh, from a lot of nuclear power generation for um, a wide host of concerns, some of which we talked about today. Um, and they're seeing a lot of success with that. And um, even, even in a lot of places in Germany that uh, are pretty cloudy for a lot of the years, they're still finding ways to uh, fulfill their energy needs using wind and solar and storage. And so um, I think Germany is an interesting case study for a country outside of the US that has been really moving away from nuclear power successfully. Um, France has really doubled down on nuclear. Um, I don't know as much about the efforts there to uh, maybe change that, um, but that is something uh, that their uh, government has really decided to support in a big way. Um, and then uh, there's, there are a lot of countries where New Scale is trying to, to you know, arrange for agreements for entering into you know, some kind of a agreement for exploring small modular nuclear reactor development. 
um, but not a whole lot of those have really moved gotten very far. Uh, Damon, I, I do know that our First Nations people up in the Canada provinces are, cons are very concerned about SMNR deployment, especially through Terra Power and the Gates Company. So people should keep an eye on that. Mm, thank you, Kathy, yes. I think we could fit in one last question. So this one says, I was looking at the map of nuclear plants across the countries and was wondering about their location. I know marginalized low income communities generally home these types of industries. Do you know more about these chosen locations? It's a great question. Yeah, and it really, uh, it varies a lot based on where you are, but that's that does tend to be really true. It, it, it tends to be the same kinds of dynamics that we see play out with uh, where fossil fuel pipelines are proposed and um, it happens a lot in rural and predominantly low income areas. Um, the Hanford nuclear site in Eastern Washington, they had to evict a, a, a mix of uh, indigenous peoples and um, white settler uh, ranchers and farmers in order to start the Hanford nuclear site. Um, and that's a pretty typical story of the nuclear industry in the United States is a lot of um, uh, various, you know, range of use of eminent domain versus siting plants and uh, de facto temporary nuclear waste storage sites uh, in communities that don't have a lot of resources to push back on it. So that does tend to be very true that um, a lot of low income and marginalized communities tend to be in the backyards of reactors. All right. Well, thank you all so much. And thank everyone in the audience for coming. I believe we're just about at time. And since there was no um... Uh, chat, can I just say that the, um, you can